Good evening, church. How's everyone doing today? So I got to be honest, throat's not doing too good. So I need you guys to sing along with me, all right? I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met you. I was breathing but not alive. All my failures I tried to hide. It was my tomb till I met you. You called my name, then I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness into your glorious day. You called my name, then I ran out of that grave, out of darkness into your glorious day now your mercy has saved my soul now your freedom is all that I know the only when I met you, you called my name, then I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day, you called my name, then I darkness
us is calling Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling Oh, come to the altar The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with The precious blood of Jesus Christ is calling Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy From the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling Oh come to the altar The Father's arms are
God, give us ears to hear. And just open our hearts, Lord. God, I pray these things in your name. Amen. I'm supposed to greet you. Hi. All right, turn and shake a hand, um, give a fist bump, say hi to someone new today. All righty. Hi. Hi. How are you? <laughs> I love my Wednesday crowd. They've gotten used to me. You know, so if you're new, this is the good crowd. How many, how, how many of you in the Wednesday crowd, you're the good crowd. You know it. That's right. Awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Let's pray over our evening tithes and offerings. Father, we call upon you in Yeshua's name. And Father God, we pray that you pour out a blessing on those who give because they give in faith. They don't give to the church, they give to you. And so the trust is in you. And so I pray that you bless that trust, bless those people who give. So saying on our side, we pray for wisdom. It's written in the book of James that if you, if you lack wisdom, ask for it. But don't doubt you're going to receive wisdom because if you doubt, then you're just you're not going to get anything from God in terms of wisdom. So we do not doubt, Lord God, that you are giving myself as senior pastor, but also the elders who give me advice, uh, the wisdom on how to use this uh, well. And I believe that you have demonstrated that wisdom in what happened this week. And we want to say thank you. I mean, it was just unbelievable, awesome what you did this weekend. And... Uh, we just want to be, just, we're just grateful for that. So we pray uh, these blessings on this giving, and we pray this in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. If you are new, if you're joining us out there online, what we do on Wednesdays is we go through the Bible in terms of a survey. These are the very same uh, Old Testament and New Testament survey notes that I would use if I were teaching New Testament or Old Testament survey at a seminary. This would be at the one, you know, the 200 level, maybe 300 level at a seminary, but that's, that's what we do. So we literally go through a summary of every single chapter in the Bible, all 1,128 of them, and we don't skip anything. But this is part of a reading program is designed to help you read through every single word. How many of you are committed to every single word? Because it is God's word. Of the Bible takes 70 weeks. We do it in six-week blocks so that there's two weeks off. So if you get behind, you can get back in it. And you can, of course, start this at any time because it's cyclical. This is actually our second time running this. And so that's what this is all about. And also, you're going to hear me use the Hebrew pronunciation of biblical names whenever I can, um, simply because I like the authenticity of it. Now, that being said, I do want to just say a couple of quick things, not in my notes, just how many of you had a marvelous time on Easter weekend? Yeah. It was the uh, largest service time or the largest service weekend, the largest attendance we have ever had <laughs> by a huge margin. We had over 2,400 people attend. We had uh, 48 uh, professions of faith in Christ that we are aware of. There are, I'm sure there are more than that, but that's what we are aware of. We had 38 people get baptized. One of them was really particularly cute. Well, there was a number of them that were. But one was really funny because a lady just gave her heart to Christ in the crowd and went right up there and just went in, clothes and all. I didn't even know her name, and she just went, I'm in, and ju jumped in the water, and we went, hi, and I baptized this lady, and it was really, really cool, and I just thought, now that's what I like to see, you know. So we had, um, I, would, I would call it extreme success from God 
uh, our Easter weekend by far. I also want to let you know that your church, God's church, that, you know, remember, the church gets as big as God wants it to be. All right, so uh, he has grown us by, on average, 403 more people per weekend than there was just four months ago. So uh, we are, God is doing this. Now, I do want to just make a quick mention of this to all of you. Because when a church changes size that rapidly, God is doing this. It's not something we did. We're, we're just preaching the word, chapter and verse. We're, we're just singing songs of worship. We've been doing that for 20 years. Why did God suddenly decide to do this now? I don't know. Maybe it's because it's the last days. Maybe because we've been faithful. Maybe because he's just doing something in surprise. His ways are higher than ours. His thoughts are not our thoughts. He is doing this. Now, that being said, I want to I throw this out to you. That, and I'm going to be mentioning this uh, on the weekend as well. We have now moved into a new realm. And I just want you to know that. We, are, we have now gone from uh, the way they divide things up when they do studies on churches. We have now gotten into very large church on the edge of mega church. We're, we're, we're right there. We're on that. Once, if God keeps breaking 2,000, then we're in the mega church range. Now, this is not something that we went out and did, like I said. But what happens when these things begin to shift is you have what's called size culture. And this is something that's very real and we need to acknowledge. Okay, when you're a small church, and we were for a dozen years, we were under 100. Every single person has my ear every week. Why? There's under 100 people and I can. Okay? And so people identify in that church setting directly with the pastor and the pastor and his wife are doing everything. You know what I mean? I mean everything. And we did. Melissa and I did everything. And that's normal and that's okay. Now, I want to be clear on this. What happens when size culture shifts is that some people will look at that negatively, won't they? They're going to go, oh, this is bad. Why? Because they liked it the way it was. <laughs> okay, and that's okay. That is why God has, in this very town, small churches. Because that fits the culture that certain people are going to need. Small church is not bad. Mid-sized church is not bad. Big church is not bad. And guess what? Mega church is not bad either. It's just a different size culture. God is doing a different thing because it, 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 it affects different people in different ways. Are you with me? So I'm asking you to continue to be in prayer. As God does this, don't look at size culture change judgmentally as if all big churches are bad. They are not. Are we still preaching the word of God? Somebody please say yes. yes. Are we going to be committed to chapter and verse until God calls us home? Say yes. yes. So nothing has changed there. I mean, uh, our music is the way it's been. It's controversial, has been since we started this church. Why? Because I grew up with hair metal bands, and that's the way I like it. Okay? And so I, I keep going, water! And they keep going, no! And, you know, so I'm already, I'm so always been, it, nothing's changed. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, it's going to be an issue. You know, some people did not grow up in the 70s with me, and where our motto was, if it's too loud, you're too old. And that's, you know, I mean, that's really what our motto was in the 70s. How many of you remember the 70s? How many of you sort of remember the 70s? Okay, okay. That's, that's, that's where I grew up. And so, you know, <laughs> not the 60s. <laughs> so, but anyway, uh, so nothing's really changed, but the culture is going to shift a little bit. You know, when you're, like I said, small church, pastor and wife do everything. But when you get to mid-sized church, everybody begins to identify more with the program. Their, their men's ministry, women's ministry, they begin to identify there. And uh, that, that's what they're involved with. That's where they are. And that, that typically goes until your church reaches about 1,000 in attendance. You start breaking 1,000, which is where we are at now, Everything shifts, and now people begin to start identifying with vision. It's, it's much bigger picture. Does that make sense? 
And that's what's going on is we're shifting this direction. Now, none of these things are bad. None of these things are bad. But it does require you to be in prayer and remain flexible as God does this around you because many of you have been here since the church was 150 people. And because of that, you've seen the shift. You've seen the change. But I assure you that as God does this, our calling to teach the word of God does not change. Hence the reason Wednesday night was started. Because as I saw this coming, I went, I want to make sure this does not get lost. So I remain committed, and you have my word that as long as the Lord has me leading this church, this is going to continue. We're going to keep after getting people to read the word of God, every single word of it. That's not going to change no matter big, how big we get. So do not panic is what I'm telling you. All right. But I would also give you one other thing. Please get involved in a life group. Please. I'm, I'm, I'm going to flat out beg you. And the reason is, as God makes us a bigger church, how do you maintain a smaller feel? You, you have life groups, small groups, 10 to 15. You get to know those people. They sit in different places and at different, uh, they go to different services. But you know somebody everywhere. You've got a close relationship with somebody at every service you go to. Oh, hey, and you, know, you know somebody. And, and, and because of that, it maintains a, a, a connected feel. It also allows us to continue. See, when we were smaller, I could directly disciple you. Let's go to lunch. I could directly disciple, or Melissa would directly disciple you. Let's go to lunch. We can't do that anymore as just, uh, you know, one couple cannot do that with 1,500 people. It's just not going to happen. So we need these small groups to help uh, continue, help you develop and apply. Live li That's why we call them life groups is because they are about living life together and, and doing this together. We need them all the more. So I'm, I'm pleading with you to get involved with those things. It's not, it's not a gimmick. It's because we see what God is doing, especially after this last weekend. It blew all of our doors off. Let's, let's, let's just be straight. We all took bets. Good bets, Christian bets. Christian bets. All of us lost. Every single person was wrong. I confess, I, I, I thought 1,800. I, I got killed. <laughs> you know what I mean? Only Steve Long said 2,000 plus, but he was off by 400. Uh, so, so, I mean, so who's buying the ice cream? I'm not sure. But I mean, uh, but, but, you know, we all, we all did. We, God took us all by surprise, uh, all of us. So I don't know what God's doing. And I just wasted too much of my time. Let's get into this. Okay, here we go. Wednesday night, week number 28. We are in the book of 1 Kings chapter 6 is where we're going to start. And that chapter I titled Solomon's Temple. All right, so what you're going to learn here, and, and now some of the things I'm going to throw out here are not in the text. They are things that we know from archaeology and stuff like that. So, for example, we know that the tabernacle had been used for over 400 years, approximately 470-ish years. The tabernacle in Shiloh had been where the center of the faith in Yahweh had been for all that time, the time of the judges. So then you have the first king, Saul, second king, David. Now you have the third king, uh, Solomon. The king, it's a, now a kingdom instead of a fractured group of tribes that just have the same language and the same basic religious pattern. Uh, so the temple was therefore a new idea. It was a new identity. Very much like what we're going through right now, it was a shift. It was a shift in thinking. The tabernacle was smaller church thought, wasn't it? Because it was smaller, smaller than the temple, and it was a temporary thing, very much like our temporary thing across the street where we have to set it up and tear it down, set it up, tear it down. Now, in Shiloh, it was permanently set up, but it had been, what, for the entire wandering in the desert, it had been set up, break down, set up, break down, set up, break down. So now they're shifting to a completely different thing. It's a permanent structure. Now, the main temple was 90 feet long and 30 feet wide and 45 feet high, which is essentially twice as big as the tabernacle. So you are, you are expanding your, um, your point of view when you do that. However, 90 feet by 30 feet by 45 feet is actually not that big. It's really not. 
Uh, not, not in comparison to like the temple at Karnak in Egypt or some of the other ancient temples that were out there. Now, what made it feel bigger, because most people, when you read uh, accounts of it and so on, it seemed so much bigger was because of the chambers around it, the, the, the outbuildings that were around it in a square, made the whole complex seem much larger. Um, so the stones were impressive. They were quarried off-site, according to this. And this is very interesting because archaeologists look at this. They really don't know how ancient people did what they did. They're still arguing about how the Egyptians built the pyramids. They're still arguing about how the Egyptians built their, their big temples that were made out of stone. And they're still arguing, even to this day, about how the temple was built. Even in the, you know, the, the, the construction that Herod did in the first century to expand the Temple Mount, there are stones in there. I have personally been there and touched them with my own hands. There is a stone in there that is so large, there is no crane on earth today that could lift it. But somebody lifted it and put it there. And they have no idea how to this day. Now, one of the clues that it says is that this was so well planned that there was no chipping, quarrying, or sound of hammers or anything on site. Everything was quarried off site to exact specifications and brought to the Temple Mount and simply put in place. And they still have no idea how they did it. That's really cool. And uh, so now, during this process, God promises in a dream to Solomon that if he will walk in God's ways, and there's the conditional thing, and that is a principle of God. If you will walk in my ways, I'm going to bless you. Guess what? That principle, still in place. How many of you knew that? You walk in his ways, you can experience his blessing in life. Not necessarily miracles, but his blessing, his providence, his care, his direction. It explains that the Holy of Holies, where the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant would be placed, was a 30-foot cube, and it was completely overlaid by gold, top, sides, and bottom. It was a giant cube of gold, an inch thick that was put on all, all the way around it. And that's where the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant went. The whole interior was, it, it took seven years to build this. It was an amazing thing. And so I, the key point is this. God works through people to accomplish his will, his will among people. But no matter how impressive anything we do might be, obedience to God from the heart is what matters most. That's what Solomon was warned about. You're doing this great big beautiful temple. Watch your own heart. Guard your own heart. Okay, so it wasn't really large. Uh, verse 2, the temple that King Solomon built, 90 feet long, 30 feet wide, 40 foot wide, 45 feet wide. There's your dimensions. It was carefully planned. Verse 7, no sound of the hammer or axe on the building site. And verse 12, this is the conditional thing. If you keep all my decrees and regulations and obey all my commands, I will fulfill through you the promise I made to your father, David. So there's the conditional part of it. And I think verse 14 is your key in this chapter. First Kings chapter 7, Solomon's house. Now, remember, the Bible always lays out what people did. And in many cases, I mean, it lays it out truthfully, but in many cases, it does not comment on the rightness or the wrongness of what people did. It just says, this is what they did. But God would not have inspired the writing of his word to include things if there was not something that we could learn from it. Does that make sense? Because it is his inspired word. We see that here in 1 Kings 7, Solomon's house. There's something implied here. We begin to see the erosion of Solomon's devotion to the Lord. We see it right here because it took six years longer to build his palace than it did to build a temple. What does that tell you? It also you find in this chapter, the very next chapter, that his house was twice as big as the temple. So who's more important in Solomon's mind? Himself. Now, it talks about how beautiful this palace was. It was, called the, it was called the Cedars of Lebanon because there was so much cedar paneling. Now, cedar, I love the smell of cedar. How many of you know that smell? Oh, it's, real cedar is just so good. Okay, and um, we, we talk about 
also in this that the bronze pillars that held up the front of the temple were so huge that they couldn't measure how much bronze was in it, and they gave them names because they were so big. One was called Hayachen, and the other was Boaz. And the key point is this. It is easy to minimize the house of the Lord in one's life, isn't it? And make your personal comfort and glory in this life a greater priority. That is a danger that all of us face, whether you're Solomon or not. Because human beings, uh, you may have noticed this, really enjoy their comforts. All human beings are like that. I wear these shoes because they fit and they're comfortable. Okay? Um, why, wouldn't, why, why, why would I wear uncomfortable things? You know, and, and, and all the choices that I make, the foods that I eat, why do I eat them? Not because they're nutritious, but because I like them. Hence this. Okay? You know what I mean? We like our comforts. We naturally go that way. Now, there's nothing wrong with wearing shoes that are comfortable. Just make sure that when God calls you to do something, I guarantee you when God calls you to do something, it will be uncomfortable. Do not make your decisions on how you're going to follow what you, what you believe in your heart is the lead of God based on whether or not it's comfortable. For example, when uh, Wes Bentley called me and asked me to go to South Sudan. Now, I knew immediately that going to one of the most dangerous countries in the world was going to be uncomfortable, also one of the poorest. But I had a decision to make. There were people in my circle, people that I know, not necessarily from this church, but we'll just outside, my family and stuff like that, that really pressed me not to go. Why? Because it's dangerous and uncomfortable. But I felt the lead in my heart, the Lord wants me to do this. So I went. And here's what I discovered. It was nowhere near as dangerous or as uncomfortable as I thought. I mean, seriously, when I got there, I mean, we landed in, in Uganda, and the first thing I found out was is that the missionary house was full. So they put me up at the Sheraton. Real uncomfortable. I'm, I'm suffering for Jesus at the Sheraton in air conditioning with a five-star dinner downstairs. I'm going, are you playing a trick on me or something? And then we go to South Sudan, and it was. It was rough. The, the roads were rough. They were horrible. There was all kinds of, you know, poverty and all this sort of thing. We come around the corner, and here's the compound that, that they built there for training the chaplains in the uh, South Sudanese army. And we go in the door, and he puts me up in the general's headquarters in a five, I know, four post bed with, I mean, it was, it was more comfortable than the Sheraton. <laughs> and I'm, I'm looking out the window at some of the worst poverty in the world, and I'm going, I feel guilty just being here. You know what I mean? So sometimes God surprises you like that. He leads you to do something. You think it's going to be uncomfortable. You think it's going to be dangerous. And God goes, watch this. Other times you think it's going to be a breeze, and that's when it's not. Either way, don't put your comforts first. Put his lead first. Don't give in to that, okay? Because he did, all right? And he began to minimize the house of the Lord in his life. So verse 1 tells us it how long it took to build. Verse 2, uh, how beautiful it was, how large it was. It was twice as big as the temple. And I think verse 1 there is your key. 1 Kings chapter 8, Shekinah. All right, so the people gather. They're going to dedicate the temple now. The ark is put in the Holy of Holies. Now, it's interesting it notices. It does not tell us what happened to Aaron's rod or what happened to the pot of manna. They, are, they were missing, and it doesn't tell us what happened. We have no idea. The tablets, the Ten Commandments, were still in the ark, um, but, but we don't know about those other two things. Now, that's pretty good to only lose two things over a 480-year period. It's not too bad, but it makes you wonder what happened to those things. Now, uh, God's glory fills the house and drives everybody out. The Shekinah glory fell on, on the temple. It was a big deal. Uh, uh, Solomon gives an incredible speech and it's a great speech when you read it it is loaded with good theology this is God's plan he you know this is the nature and character of God he can't be contained here 
Uh, he's telling the people that God is holy. I mean, and, and God responds in that moment. Um, you know, and, and, and when Solomon blesses the people, the, the amount of sacrifices the people bring in from their hearts is so overwhelming, they lost count. Again, people responded. It was an awesome thing. And you're going to read that in this chapter. Key point, I think, is this. God is greater than any physical place, this church or any other. But a dedicated physical place, like this building, can bring him glory if the people who use that space walk in humility before him. This is why I was challenging you, as God grows this church, do not become judgmental about its size, as if the bigger it is, the worse it is, or the further away we get from Acts. I've heard people tell me that. Well, we shouldn't have big churches over a thousand people because they didn't have that in Acts. And I'm going, did you read chapter 2? They ended up with a mega church in one day. 3,000 got saved. And that was just the men. They didn't count the girls. So you had instantaneous mega church in one day. Don't tell me a God is opposed to big churches because he did it himself. Okay. And, And so that's not the issue. But he is greater than any physical place, greater than any gathering, no matter how size, big it is. You two people in the house, God is there. 10,000, God can be there. It, it, it doesn't make any difference. So we just have to walk in humility. What is God doing among us? If God has led you to be a part of this fellowship, and yet it gets bigger, trust him with that, okay? Trust him with that. Because we have people, they worry about that, and that's okay to worry about it, but, you know... Give your worries to him. Take your anxiousness to the Lord when it comes to how big the church is getting. Now, verse 9 tells us about the two items that were missing uh, after 480 years, which is not too bad. Uh, Verse 11 tells us about uh, God's glory, which drives the uh, the people out. Um, And verse 27, we see Solomon knows that God is greater than any physical place. He says, but will God really live on earth? Why, even the highest heaven cannot contain you, how much less this temple I have built. Okay, and that, that was the right attitude, I think. And verse 11 is your key. 1 Kings uh, chapter 9, we see Solomon's exploits. We see a list of, of things that God does. Uh, God, God actually appears to Solomon a second time. And again, God warns him, invites him, encourages him, challenges him, however you want to put it. If you will walk in my ways... I will keep blessing you, but you see, in this this time when God speaks to Solomon, he warns him against pride because God knows what happens to us when he blesses us too much. How many of you know that one of the, God doesn't need your money. Did you know that? But one of the reasons he has instituted tithing among us is so that we are constantly aware that what what we have is not really ours. It was given by our king. God warns us against pride, and one of the best ways to keep you against pride when it comes to financial things is to make sure that you are a giver and make sure that that you are doing it uh, the way God lays it out. Um, And that's what he's warned about here because Solomon immediately makes really big mistakes, and they are based on pride. For example, in this chapter, he gives Hiram, the king of Tyre, 20 cities in the north of Israel. But those cities were given by God to the Jewish people. Why in the world would you give that to a Gentile? He's already making mistakes. He's already, you know, doing things that he should not do. He's also using a huge slave labor force in order to build all of his projects, and that's making people real upset. You know what I mean? He's also taxing people uh, to the point of, I mean, it's a real stress because of his pride. I need to build bigger. I need to build better. And he's got all these ships and he's out sending naval expeditions out to go get gold and everything else for him. And while God is blessing it, it's putting a lot of pressure down because it's, it's, it's not, it, you know, he's beginning to do things in a prideful way. And the key point I think is this, what is impressive in our lives can be lost if we walk away from the ways of our God. That's why in verse 4, he says, if you follow me with integrity and godliness as David, your father did, you know, this, there's the if. If you stick with it, you know, then I'll, I'll do this. And verses 6 through 7, but if you or your descendants abandon me and disobey the commands and decrees I've given you, if you serve and worship other gods, then I'm going to uproot you. I mean, that, that's really the bottom line. 
And here's what we see. In verse 25, it says that King Solomon came three times a year, three times a year to the temple. Now, how far away was the temple from his palace? About 100 yards. Why is it that you're only coming to the temple three times a year and you only have to walk 100 yards to get there? What is that telling you about his devotion? See, this is one of the reasons that, you know, I press people. I go all the time. Your average Christian goes to church about once a month. Solomon did something similar. Only 100 yards, but I'm going to go three times a year. Three times a year? What kind, of a, what kind of a relationship do you have here? What kind of a devotion? Where's your, see, he's beginning to slide. Are you seeing it? Starts with pride. It, 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 you know, it starts with you know, n- a lack of devotion, and, and, and it's just beginning to slide. Chapter 10, Solomon's wealth, his wealth. Now, what's interesting is the Queen of Sheba comes in this chapter to visit the king. Now, that's where modern Yemen is today, if you want to find it on a map. Uh, it's about a 1,500-mile journey, so she, you know, that tells you that his, his fame had spread quite a ways. If, 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 if a country 1,500 miles away sends its queen all the way to Jerusalem. She came with a huge parade. I mean, she brought all kinds of stuff. And she's overwhelmed by his luxury, his wisdom, his wealth, his power. And you know what? She's equally impressed with the God of Israel and takes back her belief with her, which is interesting because we have found ancient Jewish populations as far away as Ethiopia and all the way down into Yemen and other places. Because that was the whole point. Remember, that God called the Jewish people to be a light to the rest of the world. That was the whole point, okay? So, um, now, he lists off the gold here. In today's dollars, we're looking at a billion dollars a year coming into Solomon, into his personal treasury as personal taxes to him every year for 40 years. This guy made Elon Musk look like a pauper. <laughs> okay, he did. And the key point is this. The point of God's blessing on us is that we become a witness to others. That was the whole point. And you can see that it was a witness, that this blessing was a witness to other people. But you and I need to keep that in mind too as God blesses us. What is that blessing for? Is it to make us comfortable? Well, we can be comfortable. We can enjoy life. There's nothing wrong with that. But the point is to be a blessing to others, is to be a witness to others. That's why God blesses you, okay? And Solomon is beginning to miss this. Verse 1, the Queen of Sheba heard of his fame. And in verse 9, she saw that the God of Israel had done this. She openly says, praise the Lord, your God, who delights in you and has placed you on the throne of Israel. Because of the Lord's eternal love for Israel, he has made you king so you can rule with justice and righteousness. She sees that it's God that's doing this. Smart girl. And verse 14, I think, is your key. But here's another example of Solomon beginning to fall. Chapter 11, Solomon's wives. This is where he began to fall. Now, there are critics and archaeological, you know, archaeologists and stuff that are critics. There are some apologists who will try to say that Solomon's, most of his uh, wives were just political arrangements. They were not conjugal. In other words, he didn't sleep with them. I disagree wholeheartedly. The evidence is clear, especially when it says, and it's a rare word in Hebrew, it says Solomon loved many wives. Loved. He, he, these were not just political alliances. He liked these girls. Now, I'm, 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 you know, it's interesting but what you read here is that he began to take these women from tribes, cultures, and other religions that were forbidden in God's law. Now, I don't, he might have justified it for political reasons. I'm making an alliance with this country. I'm making an alliance with that country. I'll take your daughter. Okay, but uh, that's forbidden because they worship other gods. And if you're going to be in an intimate, physical relationship, it's going to have an effect on you. It will. 
And this is why when people ask me about dating unbelievers, the answer is absolutely not. No exceptions. Yeah, but I love. No, would be my answer. If you ask me my advice on this, do not date unbelievers, period. Don't think, well, I can change so-and-so. I can be a witness to so-and-so. All lies. Do not. Yeah, but I'm in love. Then get out of love. Get, get on your knees. Solomon's your example. Because it was because of these intimate arrangements. Because believe me, when you're in these kind of intimate arrangements, he had 700 wives and 300 concubines which means he could sleep with a different woman every night, seven days a week for three solid years and not see the same face twice. That's a lot. And these women, they turned, it says openly in this chapter, they turned his heart away from God. Why? Because I miss my home and I miss my culture and I miss my little... And so he began to, what, give in? And he built high places so that they could burn incense to their gods. And of course, before too long, he's going along with them. And so God brings up adversaries, discipline in Solomon's life, but he's not getting the message. Then later, he, God himself goes to Jeroboam and says, look, it, you know, when Solomon dies, and that's coming up, I'm going to give you uh, 10 of the nations, or 10 of the tribes of Israel. I'll give it to you. But, but I want you to worship me. So this is all going on. Solomon actually hears about this prophecy to Jeroboam. So what does Solomon do? Tries to kill him in order to defeat God's will. Have you missed something here, Solomon? I mean, the God who appeared to you, the God whose Shekinah glory drove everybody out of the temple, you're going to try to defy his will? What's the matter with you? Now, it doesn't say in this chapter, but we have evidence elsewhere that at the very end of Solomon's life, there is some good evidence that he turned back. How do we know this? Read Ecclesiastes. But we're not exactly sure. There is some argument that Ecclesiastes may not have been written by Solomon at all. I disagree with that from a... uh, From a scholarly point of view, archaeology point of view, I really do believe Ecclesiastes was written by Solomon, and I believe that he did turn his heart back to the Lord at the very, very end. But I do believe it was at the very end. We're talking within months of his death. Okay, and by then it's too late. You've done too much, right? And the key point is this. God will give us good reasons to repent, which he did to Solomon. But if we persist in pursuing the lust of the flesh, and remember this all started with 700 wives and 300 concubines, That lust will erode our ability to see reason. To see reason. See, verse 2, the Lord clearly instructed the people of Israel, you must not marry them, but they will turn your hearts to their gods. But Solomon insisted on loving them anyway. (laughs) He followed his lusts. And this is the wisest man that ever lived, which tells you, gentlemen, pay attention. Lust is not rational. Don't try to argue with it. Don't try to argue with it. When it comes upon you, you call upon the name of the Lord right now. Make that your new habit. Okay? Verse 8, shrines were built to please the foreign wives. Verse 10, Solomon is warned. Verse 10, he had warned Solomon specifically about worshiping other gods, but Solomon did not listen. It's right there. And I think verse 3 is your key. Now we go to 12, and this is a very sad section. Uh, this happened right around, uh, right around 950-ish uh, B.C., somewhere in that neighborhood. Uh, Rehoboam's arrogance. Okay, so Solomon kicks the bucket. His son, Rehoboam, is now king. Now, but remember, he's got lots of wives, lots of kids. This just happens to be the top dog. He becomes king. He's grown up his whole life in one of the most beautiful palaces in the world. The guy, the, the, the most, the heaviest thing he's ever lifted was a spoon to his mouth. He's never done anything. So he's arrogant. He's full of himself. Now, all of his officials come to him and say, you know what? Solomon built this thing up. It's amazing. It's beautiful. The, the, the city is beautiful. The country is strong. Everything's going great. But the taxes were overwhelming. 
and all of these building projects have sapped everybody's thing. If you'll lighten up on us, Ray, you know, they say to Rehoboam, if you'll lighten up on this, you know, hey, we'll serve you just like we serve Solomon, like we serve David. Things could be good. But his friends, who are a bunch of low-life scum, even though they are, you know, in the upper class, what are they? They're a bunch of party boys. And they say, no, Rehoboam, you're the king, man. You should stand up. You should do whatever you want to do. Of course, he listens to his pals, and he, he speaks harshly to his advisors, and it literally causes a political split where you have the entire north part of the country, all 10 tribes, all of their leaders say, we're out. We no longer are going to be a part of this. They secede from the union. That's really what they did. Now, Rehoboam doesn't quite get it because he's an arrogant little toad. And so what he does is he sends his tax collector up to the north and they kill the guy. That's going to get, you're going to get the message. Now, Rehoboam's really steamed now because he's lost the whole northern half of his country. They're killing off his guys. So he forms an army to go and, you know, get his country back. Now, Rehoboam, to his credit, to his credit, finally smartens up. And sometimes it takes this because Shemaiah, who's a man of God, a prophet, comes and tells him, don't do this, Rehoboam. I'm the one that allowed this. This is consequences for what your dad did. And I, I used your arrogance and pride to bring about my will. If you'll humble yourself, things could go well for you. And to his credit, Rehoboam goes, oh, man, I messed this up. And he backs off. He backs off. So it does not become civil war. It just becomes a border. Border between Israel in the north, Judah in the south. This is when it happened. So, Jeroboam. Let's talk about him for a minute. Jeroboam, son of Nabat. Now, God came to Jeroboam. It's pronounced Yeravoam in, uh, in Hebrew. But he comes to him and, and said, I'll give you these 10 tribes. And sure enough, God has just done that. Solomon dies. The 10 tribes swear their allegiance to him, to Jeroboam. He builds a capital city in Shechem, which later becomes known as Samaria. And now he makes a really bad choice. Jeroboam becomes a politician. He decides that the religion, religion should serve the state interest. It shouldn't be the other way around, where the state and the, you know, the king uh, serve God. God should serve the state. And that's where we are in our culture right now. Have you noticed that? Our culture has shifted. No longer does the United States of America uh, and its leadership, particularly the current uh, idiot in the White House, uh, do they look to uh, God because anybody who could stand up on Easter Sunday and call it transgender, uh, you know, appreciation day or identity day or visibility day or whatever it was on Easter, what is that doing? It's, it's a statement that is saying that religion serves the state, not the other way around. That's what Jeroboam did. He decided that, um, you know, I, I, I don't want people running down to Jerusalem to worship at the temple because it's, you know, it's going to create political problems for me. So he builds two idols. They both happen to be golden calves. Somebody didn't read the book of Exodus. How many of you know they weren't reading their Bibles? He builds two, one in the south, one in the north. And he says to the people, this is Yahweh. Now remember, in the culture of that time, idol worship was very, very common to identify a, a, an image with a, a deity. So people, you know, a lot of people did not agree with this and they did travel south to Judah. And I want to be clear about that because you're going to hear all these YouTube videos about the lost 10 tribes. There are no lost tribes. Let's be clear on that. Those 10 tribes, many of them became refugees that went to Judah because they saw this for what it was. It's idol worship. It's wrong. We're not going to be a part of it. We're going to Judah, even though our ancestral lands, Simeon, Benjamin, Dan, all of these were up in the north. They're going to come down to Judah because their loyalty was first to God, not to their tribe. But the people that stayed in the north, they started out worshiping these idols, calling them Yahweh, but eventually they ended up worshiping all kinds of other gods and became very evil. 
So Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, brings the people into this idolatry and loses God's favor. God flat out says to him, I'm going to destroy you, your whole family. I'm going to take the very memory of you out. And when he talks about memory, I mean, we remember Jeroboam. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about there are no descendants of Jeroboam. They're gone. God utterly destroyed his house. And that's the key point. When religion is used to serve your own purposes rather than being a true religion that shapes your heart, worship will end up being perverted. Not sometimes, every time. And this is a principle that can happen to you. It can happen to me. When our service to this church, when our going to church is, is about serving our own purposes rather than letting coming here change you. This is why I work hard and not just me, the other pastors do too, that when we preach a message, we always have a key, right? And that key is take this and let it change you. Take this, let it mold you. But if all you're doing is coming to this place for your own purposes because you want to build your downline in Amway because you want to, whatever it is that your, their purpose is, that's not, I'm going there to hear the word of God, understand what it says and apply it to my life, when it's serving your own purpose, you know, because believe me, there are plenty of guys that go to church because they're looking for women. That's their purpose. Oh, yeah, I've met them. And that's their whole purpose. I'm, one in particular, I remember uh, flat out telling me, I'm just here because I'm looking for her. And I went, that is your own purpose. Now, it's not necessarily wrong to want to find a wife. Not necessarily wrong to find, want to find a husband. It's not necessarily wrong to want to find a wife or a husband by going to a good church. I think that's smart rather than going to a bar, thank you. But that shouldn't be the purpose of your heart. Now, if that's on your mind, again, make sure it's secondary. It's okay to have it. If you're single and or a widowed or whatever and you're going, I just, I, you know, there's nothing wrong with wanting to meet somebody here. Nothing wrong with it. Just make sure and pray about it that it's always secondary to I'm here to grow. I'm here to, to hear from the living God and grow in him. If I get to meet Mr. Right, Miss Right, Mrs. maybe, I don't know, that's, you know, widowed or whatever, whatever the deal is, that's just gravy. Or better yet, whipped cream on the top of ice cream. Whatever. You understand what I'm saying? Make sure that. Learn that from this story because Jeroboam, he thought of religion Purely in political terms, verse 27, when these people go to Jerusalem to offer sacrifices at the temple, they're going to give their allegiance to King Rehoboam. That's my fear. And so that's why he did this horrible thing. And in verse 30, it became a great sin. The people worshiped the idols. Okay? Verse 32, Jeroboam went so far that he, not, he instituted his own religious holidays I mean, he took it, I mean, remember, who's supposed to be the priest of the class? Levites, tribe of Levi, right? He appoints priests to his little idols. He starts calling them Yahweh, but he's getting other people to be priests. They're not even Levites. I mean, he just goes that far because it's just a political thing as far as he is concerned. Verse 32 tells you that. And I think verse 8 is the key in this chapter. Now, 1 Kings chapter 13 the false old prophet. This is a really sad story. And what it shows you in when you read this, remember, God is simply going to tell you what people did. It doesn't tell you the rightness or the wrongness of it. It just tells you this is what people did. And it, it's faithful to the, the true story. Now, there's a lot of things you could read into this, but be careful when you read into this because we do similar things. We start out right. We're doing something. We know God is in it. And then we get distracted and we go off and we do something over here. God is no respecter of persons. None. Pastor, ministry leader, prophet, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Don't get distracted. That you can read from this chapter. Because there's a man of God here in this chapter, a prophet. He gets a word. He goes to Jeroboam, right? He goes to Jeroboam, son of, you know, and he says, hey, in the future, after God has destroyed your entire world and your whole family, there's going to come a real, a real king. His name will be Josiah. 
That actually happened 340 years later. You can read about it in 2 Kings uh, 23, 15. But the prophet who's giving this word that he has says, now remember, miracles are always given, not for your comfort, but they're always given to authenticate a message. Does that make sense? Or a, or a man of God or the word of God. Okay, you know, like fulfilling a prophecy. That's a miracle. It fulfills God's word. Okay, so the prophet gives a sign. He says, you know, this altar is going to split and ashes are going to pour out from it because he's talking about this false altar. And Jeroboam's standing right there. And the man, the man gets, is, you know, Jeroboam's angry and he arrests him. And as soon as he throws his hand out like that, it withers. Not only that, the altar splits. And, there's a, and it splits and ashes come out exactly as the prophet said. Now, how many of you know that if that happened to you, it should change your thinking? How many of you know that, that you should change your thinking? I mean, if it was me, I don't know about you, but if it was me and I saw that, I'm going, tear that altar down, destroy that, we're going a different direction. You know what Jeroboam does? None of that. He just says, give mercy on me because my hand. And, and so the, the prophet prays for him, and his hand is restored. So he's had two miracles in a row, three. He's had, well, four. He's had the prophecy. He's had the altar split right in front of him. He had his hand wither, and then he himself is healed. And he does nothing to change it. Does nothing. Does not take down the, the idols. Nothing. See, and this proves a point, too. Because we often say, you know what? If, if I had a miracle, then I would do X. No, you won't. Because it's all about the heart. Don't look for God to do miracles in your life before you're going to do what he tells you to do. You make up your mind, I'm going to do what God tells me to do, whether it's a miracle or not. Whether I get blessing or not, I'm going to do what's right. Don't be Jeroboam. Did you know that when we first got into this building, 2012, I had a, call it a vision, call it a, I don't know. But I had a word of the Lord come to me. And I actually put up a sign down there in what is today room one, we used to call that Cubeville back in those days. And I put a big sign up above so that my whole staff would see it as they're walking out the door. And my whole staff was a grand total of about three people. But anyway, I, I put it up there. It said, remember Jeroboam, son of Nabat. And I put it up there because I knew that we needed to remember. We cannot let, even though God has blessed us with this building, we cannot allow ourselves to lose sight, ever. We do what's right because it's right, not because it's easy or because we might get a blessing out of it. And I, I, I've not forgotten that. Jeroboam is, is a, 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 a evidence to me that you could have miracles right in front of you and still do the wrong thing. And to me, this building was such a miracle, I want to make sure I don't do the wrong thing just because God, you know, God did a miracle, I want to make sure I'm doing the right thing. Does that make sense? Now, uh, the prophet also makes a big mistake because God told the prophet, do not eat or drink anything until you go to Jeroboam and come all the way home. That was the deal. He got halfway because he gets to Jeroboam, gives the message, everything is right. He's on his way home and some other dude shows up who's also a prophet. Now, this would be like me running into another pastor here in town, okay? Somebody I know. And, and the guy says, hey, come and have dinner with me. And the prophet who talked to Jeroboam says, well, I can't because God told me not to eat or drink anything until I get home. Well, this guy just flat out lies. Just flat out lies. Well, I also had a word from God. Said, you're off the hook now. You can come and have dinner with me. And he buys it. Goes and eats with the guy. And right in the middle of the meal, the lying prophet gets a real word from God. You blew it, dude. Now, I don't know what happens to the liar, but I do know what happens to the guy who bought the lie. He steps out the door and gets eaten by a lion. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's bad news. Because God is holy. He is no respecter of persons. If he tells you to do something, do it. If he leads your heart, do it. All the way, all the way to the end. Okay, that's, that's, a, that's an important thing for us to, to, to know here. Now, 
We want to get down on the lying prophet, but we don't really know what happened there. For all we know, he did have a vision or a dream. He just didn't check it was from God. And you know one of the things that I've learned? No one can tell you God's will except God. Let me say that again. No one can tell you God's will except God. Be real careful with that. When somebody walks up to me and says, I have a word for you from God, I'm always like, I'll take that with a grain of salt. Thank you. Because if it doesn't line up with what God's been revealing to me, and if it doesn't line up with God's word, it ain't for me and it ain't from God. Or both. You know, does that make sense? I've learned that the hard way. So did he. Hope, fortunately for me, no lions yet. Okay. Key point is this. We should keep the commands of God no matter how subtle and innocent the temptation is to disobey, period. We should keep his commands. Verse 9, it's clear. The Lord gave me this command. You must not eat or drink anything while you are there. Do not return to Judah by the same way you came. Verse 18, the old prophet says, I'm a prophet too. Angel gave me a command from God. There's the lie. Verse 22 is the judgment, okay? Um, because you ate or drank, you know, you ate and drank, your body will not be buried in the grave of your ancestors. Verse 24 is where he gets killed by uh, the lion. And, you know, it's, it's a sad story, but like I said, there are important principles here. Verse 18, I think, is your key. But again, the principle, make sure that if, you know, I'm not saying, because uh, I've had people come to me and say, I have a word from the Lord for you. And I've heard that, and I went, you know, that, that lines up with what God's been, you know, telling my heart, right? That lines up with God's word. I, I, can, t I can receive that. There have been other times that people have come to me, I got a word for you. And it just rub it hits me like, whoa, there's something off with that. Does that make sense? I can just sense it in my spirit. That's not right. Not only that, I'm going, that doesn't line up with God's word. In fact, that contradicts what I read in God's word. So what am I going to do with that? Reject that. You know, because somebody might come up to you and say, you know, I have, you know, this happened to me when I was a young man um, going to college. I mean, so this was way back when we had to shoot the dinosaurs off the field before, you know, we did marching band and stuff. Okay, it was a long time ago. And long before I got married. I mean, it was just way back. But this is a, a lesson. I was going to college and I had met this pretty young girl and um, I'd asked her out and uh, only to find out because we went to um, just like a McDonald's. I mean, it was nothing major. And, but I found out in the process of that conversation, not only is she not a believer, not a Christian, but thought I was kind of weird because that was one of my questions, right? And so I thought, well, end of that dating time, okay? But I had a Christian friend. Now, again, that term loosely, because I knew this guy. We were going to the same college, and he was one that used to tell me, well, you know, I'm a Christian, but I really don't like the letters of Paul. Now, I'm a 19-year-old kid. What do I know, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, he convinced me, well, I've heard from God, too. It was almost this. Now, this was back before I'd read the whole Bible is why I want our young people to read it all. And he, he convinced me, you should, you should be dating her. And I did. And you know what? It did not go well for me. It ended very poorly, very badly. I don't want to go into the details of that. Now, there is a silver lining to that. That ended badly. It ended uh, with a lot of broken heart on my side. But what was interesting is that six months after breakup and all of that, right, and heartbreak and all this, here's what God did. That girl got saved and is still a professing Christian to this very day. So God did turn that around, but I assure you, it was one of these kind of situations. You know what I mean? So be careful when somebody says, I have a word for you. Well, does it line up with God's word? Because the Bible tells me clear as day, don't date people, or don't marry people. I mean, dating is the same thing. Don't be involved intimately with people uh, from a romantic point of view that are not believers. They're, they're, they're not of, no, they're not of the family. Don't. I should have, I should have seen that. 
I should have, I should have went like this prophet. He should have went, well, wait a minute. That's contradicting what God told me. I'm, I'm not going, no. But it cost him his life. It cost me a broken heart. You know? But God is good. At least he didn't let me get eaten by a lion. It is now time for the famous seventh inning stretch. Yeah. All righty then. For those of you that are new, those of you out online, the seventh inning stretch is about shifting from Old Testament to New Testament in our survey. And uh, we do fewer New Testament than Old because there are 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 in the New, and there are some really long ones in the Old. <laughs> uh, in fact, I, you know, it's kind of wild, the Old and New, we really shouldn't those terms are, I mean, they've been used now for a thousand years, so it's hard to get away from it. But it's really, you know, the Hebrew Bible is, the Tanakh is what we're looking at, what we call Old Testament. And the New Testament is Bit Hadrash. It's, it's a New Covenant, okay? So really we should think of it in Hebrew terms, in, in my view, that, because we follow a Jewish Messiah. How many of you knew that? Okay, so we should really look at it from that point of view. All right, here we go. Now, last week, uh, we did John chapter 6. We did the whole thing. We, uh, in your reading program, you're only, you were only supposed to read half of it. So last week, when I covered John 6, I covered the whole thing. But now we do it basically again because um, this is the second half of John 6. Okay, I called it Bread. And this is where we get uh, the feeding of the 5,000, where Jesus walked on water. Um, we see the jealousy and the envy of the Pharisees and the other leaders. Now, again, we see Yeshua openly saying he is God in the flesh, openly doing things that only God can do. And what we, we know, because we study these things, is that the rabbis for centuries, now these rabbinic writings were, are not in the Bible. They're rabbinic writings. The Talmud, Mid, Midrash, they're, they're different things. Well, the rabbis had interpreted for centuries what kind of miracles the Messiah would do. Now, whether God directly revealed that to them or they, they pulled it out of their interpretation of the Tanakh is unclear. But what is fascinating is that Yeshua fulfilled all of them. And he did it right in front of them too. But of course, he's also criticizing them because they had done what Jeroboam had done. They had turned religion into serving them instead of really being loyal to the God who had instituted these things. And so for them, their religion uh, was all about making themselves rich, famous, comfortable. That's what they wanted. They wanted power, and, and they had it. They had power over people. Uh, the Romans sure had come in with their armies and were running the country, but they were at the top of the heap when it came to being Jewish, right? They had the ear of the governor, Pilate, they, they, uh, they were very wealthy. Uh, and Yeshua comes along and points out their hypocrisy, how they're destroying the faith, how they had twisted the word of God that made them look bad. 
Uh, They envied the fact that so many of these people were flocking to him. Uh, They were trying to explain away the miracles, um, even though they were fulfilling their own writings, much less the Tanakh. And so we see that in this chapter, and so Yeshua just doubles down. He goes, if you are not as devoted to me as if eating my flesh and drinking my blood was your food and drink, if you're not that deep, then you have no part of me. You don't know me. I am the Messiah, and you have got to literally feed on me. Now, he's not talking about physical. They accuse him of cannibalism, and he's going, I'm talking with spiritual things here. You know what I mean? What does he mean? He means the words that he speaks, who he is. Now, we as believers, we are devoted to Yeshua. Devoted to him. He's our our loyalty. He's our identity. He's everything to us. Because we, we look to him like we look to food, like we look to drink. That's what he's talking about. That's what he's talking about. And he, and he challenges them. Now, of course, a whole bunch of people, they can't handle that. They bail out, right? The 12 don't. They stick it out. But they still, they don't get it. They're shaken by it. But later they get it. Now, the key point is this. The Lord will continually challenge us to take our faith in him to the deepest level because he wants to discourage every material or earthly motivation to follow him. Now, we went over these verses last week, so we're not going to go into detail. Verse 11 is the five, in, you know, five loaves, two fish. Uh, chapter, or verse 27 is where he challenges them to look for the eternal, the spiritual, not what is material. So you know he's speaking spiritually when he talks about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. That's the context. Verse 29, the greatest work is to believe in him. In fact, that's the, it says that the only work God the Father wants from you is to believe in the one he has sent. I mean, that's it. And verse 53, you got to, you know, you got to eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood. Okay, verse 43, I think, is your key. All right, John chapter 7, right judgment. Now, this, this particular chapter has been misused and is misused by the world to this day. Judge not, right? You know that whole thing? You'll find that here. But what's interesting is, is that people misunderstand what he's saying. He's not saying don't judge. He's saying don't judge stupidly. <laughs> you know, that's what he's saying. All right, but anyway, we also find out here, now this is going to go against Catholic theology, so we have to, you know, we, we, we got to remember that, you know, let's be really clear on this. We are saved from our sins by faith alone, period. Faith alone in Yeshua alone. That's it. So be careful not to be totally judgmental on people who are not uh, who, who have mixed other things into it. For example, um, I have some Roman Catholic friends that I know without a doubt in my heart these people are genuinely born again. They're going to heaven. That's a fact. And I know there are people that are, get angry at me for saying that. I'm not saying we should convert to Roman Catholicism at all. But I am saying that within that, there is still the message that Jesus died on the cross for our sins and that by believing in him, we are saved from those sins. Now, they've got a whole lot of other stuff that they've added in there that I vehemently disagree with. And there are a lot of people who are Catholic who are not born again at all. They're not, they're not Christians at all. You know what I mean? They, just, they show up at Mass every once in a while and you know, they say, well, I'm Catholic, therefore I'm good. No, they missed it. And there are people that worship Mary, and that is absolutely wrong in every way, shape, and form. There are people that, that, that worship idols and icons and things like that. They are out of line. They are wrong. But be careful. Our salvation is by what? Faith alone, in Christ alone, that we learn from the Scriptures alone. These are called the solas. Now, the reason I mention that is because in this chapter, in John 7 which I titled Right Judgment, you see that Yeshua had physical brothers and sisters. These are, from this chapter and others like it, children of Miriam, Mary. He had at least five brothers and two sisters. Big family. At least eight in this family, Yeshua is the oldest. Okay? 
the scriptures are clear that, that Mary was a virgin when Yeshua was born. It says that Joseph did not have relations with her until after he was born. So all of these children come after. Now, Catholic theology has switched this and said that all of these children must have been from, uh, from uh, Joseph's first marriage and, you know, whatever. And there is no scriptural evidence for this at all. It's just trying to elevate Mary up into some goddesshood or something. And it's wrong. It's right here. He had at least five brothers, at least two sisters, minimum. We don't know what became of them. We, don't, we, we know a few of them. We know uh, James, Judas, and Simeon. Uh, we know those names. But, you know, but it's clear in this chapter, they didn't, these five and two, they didn't believe in him until after the resurrection. But his brother James became one of the big leaders in the church. His brother Jude uh, wrote the book of Jude that we have. His brother Simeon, I mean, they became believers. Why? Because they grew up in the same household with this guy. They thought he was bats, <laughs> right? You know, they see him die on the cross and their mom is down there in Jerusalem. Can you imagine? Your, your oldest brother's going to, you know, being crucified and you're all embarrassed up beyond me. It was a big family thing. But after the resurrection, he intentionally goes to those, to his family members. Intentionally. Here I am. And they became believers. In fact, James, tradition tells us they called him old camel knees because he spent six to eight hours a day on his knees in prayer. And he went to his grave proclaiming Yeshua. He never once called him my physical brother. It was too, he was too elevated for that. In James's mind, this is God in the flesh. That he happened to grow up in my house, he, it was just a humble thing for him. He was on his face. Good guy, James was. I look forward to having conversations with him. I really do. So he had, he had brothers, he had sisters. Now, while he's talking, the, you know, he's at the church, or the church, he's at the temple, and he's causing quite a stir because of what he's teaching. And the leaders are offended, and they're challenged. Why? Because, you see, in their minds, who did you study under? Now, notice they're not looking at what he's saying, they're trying to attack him because of what's called, in logic, we call this the fallacy of the appeal to authority. People do this frequently. Um, uh, before I got a doctorate degree, before I was Dr. Marx, that was one of the challenges. I would bring up stuff in apologetics, and they would say, well, you're not an authority. And I would go, it doesn't matter what the authority is. It matters what the truth is of what I'm saying. The tr and that Jesus says the same thing. It doesn't matter if I studied under this rabbi or that rabbi. It, what am I saying? And you know, it's funny. I got a doctorate degree, but it's a doctor of ministry. So guess what? It didn't help me at all. Because they say, well, that's not a real PhD. <laughs> really? Do you have any idea how expensive and how many papers and a dissertation I had to write? No, it's real. But it doesn't do me any good. I wonder why I did it now. Okay, but anyway, uh, so, but uh, anyway, he, uh, he never studied under this important rabbi, but he points out the hypocrisy of what they're saying. You guys are plotting to kill me and you're wanting to uh, challenge my authority? Which part of you shall not murder did you misread from the, the law, right? I mean, he, he comes after them, you know, but uh, they don't like it. Now, of course, people who are listening in on this they go, they're not really trying to kill you. And they think he's crazy for, or paranoid for saying that. But Jesus says, no, they really are trying to kill me. And of course, later we find out they, they really were. They're attacking him because of miracles done on Shabbat, because that's work. And he just blows it right back in their faces. He goes, it's right in your own law. It's right in your own law. The Levites work on Shabbat. You know, there is a higher law. And my father's working all the time, so I'm working too. It doesn't matter if it's Shabbat. Besides, I'm Lord of Shabbat. As soon as he says that, he's making a claim to be what? God. And they know it, which is why they pick up stones. When you say you're Lord of Shabbat, you're saying that you are God. And they knew that, okay? But you know, this also shows us that there are higher and lower laws within God's economy and his thought. 
Make, make, make sure you understand that. Like, you shall not, you know, the Sabbath day, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Do not work on the Sabbath day. That's in God's law. It's a principle. Okay, it's there. But guess what? I work every Shabbat. How many of you knew that? Okay, am I wrong? No, Yeshua just said it right here. I'm one of the Levites. So, you know, you know, it's not that I'm off the hook. It's that there are higher and lower laws in what God, you know, in God's economy. And you, you can see this in a number of different places. This is just one of them. And, and this is where he's talking about uh, judgments and things like that. Judge righteously. Recognize there's higher and there's lower. Recognize where these things fall, you know. And that's, that's an important thing. So the key point is this. There are bedrock principles underneath the laws of God, under his ordinances, and the morality of God. These are principles you need to discern to apply God's law correctly into your life. Very important that you look for the principles that are underneath things. Okay? God's law is, is still God's law. And let's be clear on that. Now, we don't follow the Mosaic law, do we? But neither did Abraham because it hadn't been written yet. Does that make sense? So we have to understand that the Mosaic law, what it is, is it's an expression, it's an expression of the principles that are underneath those laws. Those principles are forever. How many of you know that that God still didn't want people to lie before it was written, you shall not lie? Does that make sense? Okay, so the principle is always there. The the law was simply given to express it. And I've mentioned this before because people have challenged me, especially Jewish people when I'm talking to them. Well, you know, you can't just take bits and pieces of the law. Why do you Christians, you know, eat shrimp other than the fact that shrimp is really good? Okay, why? 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 Because it says in the law you shouldn't do that. Well, hold your horses. Let's look at what the principle is underneath that. When you look at all of the forbidden foods that are in there, every single one of them are going to be mixed animals of some kind or unclean in some way. How many of you want to eat bats anyway? (laughs) Okay, but, you know, the point is they're mixed. They're mixed creatures. What was the principle? You don't mix with God. You worship him and him alone. Because even back in those cultures, they, you know worship this God on Mondays and this God on Thursdays and this God on Saturdays, right? They mixed it all up all over the place. And so God wanted them to go, every time I put on my trousers, I got to make sure that it's not polyester with cotton because I don't mix. It's not an issue of keeping the law. It's me thinking I don't mix my beliefs. I don't mix who I am. I am singular in my focus and my loyalty to the one true God. And it's right down to the clothing that I wear, the foods that I eat, everything. Now, those things were completed because that was a way of expressing that principle. Now, God has the Holy Spirit in your heart. Now, God has the Holy Spirit in your heart, which leads you a different way than knowing the 640 laws. Because God knew the world was going to get considerably more complicated than it was in ancient times. And now you have to decide, Is it wrong to do, um, well, look at naked bodies. Is that wrong? Be careful. Because if you say yes, then every time you take a shower, you commit a crime. (laughs) Every time you change your two-year-old, you commit a crime. If you're a doctor, you're committing a crime. No, it's not. It's how you're looking. It's the intent of the heart. It's your reasons. It's the principle. And the Holy Spirit will guide you. The Holy Spirit will guide you. Are you with me? Okay, so that's the understanding. The principles are what matters. And you can see this in this uh, passage. Verse 16, he he explains that the message he's giving is from God the Father. Verse 22 is where he talks about Shabbat, the Sabbath. And verse 24 is where he explains higher and lower laws. Verse 24 is very clear. Look beneath the surface so you can judge correctly. Look beneath the surface. What is the principle underneath that? That's going to help you make a a proper judgment on these things. Verse 24 is your key. And our last chapter for the evening is John chapter 8, which I titled Caught But Taught. You may have a better title. 
But I want to be clear on this from an archaeological point of view. Listen carefully now. There is some great debate in John chapter 8. Some great debate in John chapter 8. It even rhymes. Okay, why? Because verses 53 through chapter uh, 8 verse 1. So chapter 7 verse 53 through eight, uh, chapter 8 verse 11. Some of your Bibles don't even have it. They don't even have it. It ends at uh, John 7, uh, 53, or 752, and there is no 53. Some of you do not have verses 1 through 11 in your Bibles. There's a reason behind that. Now, let's go through it. The oldest manuscripts that we have of the New Testament do not have this section. That is a fact. Let's be clear on that. This section between uh, chapter 7, verse 53, and chapter 8, verse 11, is not in the very oldest manuscripts. I mean, when we're talking the very oldest, we're talking the ones that date to the very early 2nd century. However, anything mid-2nd century, so we're talking 125, 130, 140 A.D. and up, have this section. And the early church fathers quote it going all the way back into the 60s. In other words, this was a very well-known story within Christianity that, that was not included. But it was so well-known and it was quoted by so many of the early church fathers that in the mid-second century, people started adding it into the actual manuscripts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In fact, some of them put it in the book of John, some of them put it in the book of Luke. Luke chapter 21, verse 38, some, some will put it over there. because So you have manuscripts that are early second century that will have this in different places. So what does that tell you? It tells you that the early writers knew this story was authentic. They knew it was real. And remember, John himself says, hey, this isn't everything that Jesus said and did. There were plenty of other things, right? Well, this happens to be one of those other things that by the, by the mid-second century began to be added back in. And it's one of my personal favorite stories in the Bible. This is the woman caught in adultery. That's the story here. She, remember, she was caught in the act, the very act, and dragged in, and they were going to stone her, and they're challenging Yeshua on what to do. Do you remember what he did? He didn't even answer he just gets down, starts doodling on the ground. And they're challenging him, and he's just, he is so angry. I, I, that's why he's, I, I think that's why he's doing that. I think he's down there going, I am so mad. Everybody's going to die in about three seconds. I need to write this out. Or I'm, <laughs> because remember, he's, he, he's fully human <laughs> as well as fully God. I'm, I'm sure he's, this was a, I need a timeout. Because <laughs> why? First of all, the guilty man is not brought. Now, wait a second. That, that exposes this for what it was. This was a setup. This poor girl was dragged into this situation. Now, she's wrong. She, 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 you know, this wasn't a rape. She was doing this. She was involved. But according to the law of Moses, you have to have at least two witnesses to the actual act. So somebody's standing in the hidden room looking through a knot hole, watching this whole thing. Now, why would you do that? Why would you do that? I mean, so, so, I mean, everything wrong about this situation. Everything. But Yeshua, you know, he just finally gets up and says, okay, fine. Yeah, you're right. You want to be legalistic about it? Yep, you're right. So who gets to throw the first rock? The one of you out there that has no sin, you do it. And starting with the oldest... They drop their rocks and bail. Who's the only person there that had the right to throw a rock? Yeshua. He's the only one. Because he had no sin. Why does he forgive her? I'll tell you why. It's not because he just forgives everybody who commits adultery. That's not it. He knew her heart. And that girl was not just repentant because she got caught. She's repentant because she's genuinely repentant or the Lord would never have said your sins are forgiven. 
Okay, he knows the hearts. You know, and it's interesting when you read this. The Pharisees insult the Lord several times while they're going through this. They, they, they imply that he's a bastard. They imply that he's, you know, suggesting suicide when he says, you know, I'm going to go where you can't find me, that sort of thing. You know, they, they insult him when he talks about there's only death in sin. I mean, they, they really do, you know. But Yeshua explains here that if we're his true disciples, listen, we will abide in his word, which is why you're here tonight. So many believers, well over 80%, have never read this book cover to cover. You have, because you understand that if you want to truly follow him, you've got to abide, rest in, be in his words. And he promises eternal life to those that will do this and follow him. He directly claims to be God in this chapter again, again. I mean, it's just amazing. And the key point is this. Jesus openly declared he was God in the flesh. He openly challenged everyone to either believe in him and have everlasting life or choose eternal death. Verse 3 is where the woman is caught in adultery. Verse 7 is where he confronts their hypocrisy and says, all right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first rock. Verse 11 is where, you know, it's interesting that when he says forgiveness, he says, go and what? Sin no more. In other words, he's not saying be sinless after this. He's saying, don't continue in this lifestyle of sin that, that I just forgave you from. Don't, don't go there. And in verse 58, he declares openly, and this is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. You can use this with Mormons. You can use this with Jehovah's Witnesses. John 8, 58, memorize this one. Jesus directly says, I tell you the truth, before Avraham was even born, I am. Ego eimi, in Greek, it is exactly the same words that Moses used in the Septuagint in Exodus 3, 14. He is openly declaring himself to be Yahweh, right there. John 8, 58, it's one of your key verses you should memorize, and that is the key verse in this chapter, we are 11 minutes over. Let's pray. <laughs> Father God, we call upon you in Yeshua's name. We worship you and you alone. Because you openly explained to us who you were. The miracles you did confirm who you are. We have learned from Solomon's example. From Jeroboam, the son of Nabat. We have learned that we need to be utterly devoted to you from the heart. We have learned from your word in the, in the New Testament that, that we need to abide in your word. We need to rest in it, be in it, read it, sing it, memorize it, talk about it, learn from it, guide our very lives by the principles therein. It's the same old and new. Help us, Lord God, to be a people of your word. A people not legalistically of your word, but allowing the word to transform us in a humble way. Help us to do this, Lord God, for the days are near when you will call for us. And we long for it. Maranatha, come and get us. We long to see you, to be called into your presence. This place, we would rather be with you. The very best that this world has to offer is nothing. Come and get us, Father God. But in the meantime, help us to live for you as we wait for that day. We pray these things in Yeshua's name. Amen. You guys have a great week. Hopefully see you next time.
Watching the nightly news Don't seem to find the rhythm Just wanna sing the blues Feels like a song that never stops Feels like it's never gonna Gotta get that fire fire back in my bones Before my hard heart turns into stone So won't somebody please pass the megaphone I'll shout it on the count of three Joy, joy, down in my heart, down in my heart to stay. 